Welcome to my channel. My name is Man the Wall. I talk about history, politics, and whatever else I feel like that day. Sorry I've been gone for a while, but between my computer crashing, working on my college applications, school starting up again, and going through another wave of anxiety, making new videos hasn't exactly been my top priority. But I don't want to just ignore this channel of mine, so I figured I'd make a new video for y'all properly. So, in American politics, and politics in general, there are certain figures who seem to transcend political parties and presidential administration to become influential, bipartisan figures over a long period of time. Perhaps one of the most famous examples of this is Henry Kissinger, the man who served as Secretary of State under President Nixon and National Security Advisor under President Ford. Today, he's regarded as a respected foreign policy statesman, a maverick who's advised presidents from both parties and is highly regarded amongst much of the political and media establishment. And wrongly so. Because Henry Kissinger is, at least in my eyes, one of the most vile and destructive figures ever to exist in American politics. And for that matter, politics, period. He represented nothing short of the absolute worst American foreign policy instincts during the Cold War, and is the kind of man who ought to be rotting in the hog, or better yet, put against a wall and shot. But why, you may ask, do I hold this position? Why do I have such distaste for Mr. Kissinger? Well, my friend, that's what this video is for. For the next 20 minutes, I will list off, in detail, to the best of my ability, the numerous fuck-ups, bad decisions, and crimes against humanity Kissinger gleefully engaged in during his time holding public office. So, without further ado... Before we get into the many, many, many egregious misdeeds and misdemeanors of this most malicious of men, let's focus on the one or two things Kissinger actually did right. He was a strong advocate for pursuing a policy of detente with the Soviet Union, helping construct the SALT-1 Treaty, which capped the amount of strategic ballistic missile launchers at existing levels, as well as the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which limited both the US and the USSR to ABM complexes. He helped engage in negotiations which ended the Yom Kippur War launched by Egypt to reclaim the, si the Sinai Peninsula from Israel, which it had lost in 1967. His negotiations with Rhodesia helped lead to the downfall of the white minority in that nation. As well, his early visits to Beijing in 1971 and helped pave the way for normalized relations with the People's Republic of China, which was a mixed blessing to say the least, but was probably better than the alternative of an isolated, paranoid, and poverty-stricken Beijing with an extremely tense relationship with Washington. And he did help start the negotiations to end the Vietnam War, even if much of his policy during the actual conflict was nothing short of reprehensible, but more on that later. Alright, we've looked at the good, now let's dive headfirst into everything else. Anyone who knows anything about the history of the Tsars know they weren't exactly the nicest to the Jews living in their empire. And with the creation of the Soviet Union, these trends didn't exactly stop. They were at their worst under Stalin, who launched a campaign against rootless cosmopolitans, guess what he really meant, from 1948 to 1953. These conditions worsened again under Brezhnev following the cutting off of relations with Israel after the Six Day War. In one particularly egregious example, a Ukrainian Jewish radio engineer named Boris Kobajitsky was placed under house arrest after he sent a letter to Brezhnev expressing an interest in moving to Israel. Refusnik became a nickname for Soviet Jews who, who like Kobajitsky, wanted to emigrate to that country. This resulted in a government crackdown which drew large-scale international outcry right about the time that Kissinger took office. And, in 1973, in a chat with Nixon on the subject of Soviet Jewry, a conversation I'm surprised Nixon even had given his infamous anti-Semitism, Kissinger, who I should remind you, was a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, said the following, quote unquote, the emigration of the Jews from the Soviet Union is not an objective of American foreign policy, and if they put Jews in gas chambers in the Soviet Union, it is not an American concern. Maybe it is a humanitarian concern. But honestly, while that is terrible, frankly, for Kissinger, ignoring a crisis is small potatoes given some of the other stuff he's done. In 1989, as the Eastern Bloc satellites began to crumble one by one, major demonstrations broke out in China calling on the government of Deng Xiaoping to institute democratic reforms. I don't really think I need to tell you how that ended. In the midst of these summer protests, Kissinger said that, quote unquote, no government in the world would have tolerated having the main square of its capital occupied for eight weeks by tens of thousands of demonstrators who blocked the authorities from approaching the area in front of the main government building. This wasn't related to any policy Kissinger was involved with, but I must say, it does hurt your credentials as a supposed anti-communist crusader when you literally defend the military and police crackdowns on protests by an autocratic communist or so-called communist regime.
In 2019, many were shocked by Trump's decision to pull out of the predominantly Kurdish Rojava Federation in northeastern Syria. However, America betraying the Kurds goes back much longer than Chino Benito. In the 1970s, Saddam Hussein began his slow rise to total dominance in Baghdad. America, and its then client state of Iran, then run by Shah Mohammad Rezi Pahlavi, did not like this one bit. So they began allying themselves with Kurdish rebels in order to weaken the Ba'athist Republic. However, there were also Kurdish people in Iran, who both Pahlavi and Kissinger feared an uprising by. So, at an OPEC meeting in 1975, the Iranian Shah in Iraq, in what became known as the Algiers Agreement, made peace. Iraq conceded former territorial demands to Iran, and in exchange, the Shah, and by extension the United States, stopped supporting Kurdish rebels in Iraq. Twelve years later, Saddam's Iraq would, with the tacit support of the United States, kill up to 100,000 Kurdish men, women, and children in what became known as the all on fall Genocide. In the 1960s, the island of Cyprus gained independence from the British Empire after four years of guerrilla warfare. Right off the bat, tensions were high between the Greek and Turpriot Cypriots, and intercommunal violence and tensions ran high. Presiding over all of this was an orthodox archbishop by the name of Markarios III. Despite his attempts to keep peace on the island, he was relentlessly opposed by both the Greek far-right in Cyprus itself and the far-right military junta in Greece. And both of these forces just so happened to be backed by America and Henry Kissinger. Like the fascist Greeks, Kissinger cared little for Markarios, who he felt was too sympathetic to communism. Bizarre, given that he was an orthodox archbishop, and knew well that the Greeks were plotting to overthrow Markarios, and by the looks of things, was perfectly okay with that. And, in 1974, when the fascist Greek forces wishing to be reunited with the fascist Greek junta tried to overthrow Markarios and seize control of the island, Kissinger proved that he was okay with this coup by ordering American diplomats to recognize the new government's supposed foreign affairs ministers, adding legitimacy to the new regime. Luckily, this coup failed, as Turkey launched an invasion to claim the northern half of the island. This did defeat the fascist coup attempt, but almost caused a full-scale conflict between two NATO members, a large-scale ethnic cleansing against Greek Cypriots living in the northern half of the island, created a frozen conflict that continues to this very day. Turkey still occupies the northern half of the island and its capital city of Nicosia. In the early 1970s, Spain, still under the ironclad rule of Francisco Franco, was losing control over the Spanish Sahara, known today as Western Sahara. At the time, the majority of the Sahari people who lived in the Sahara supported independence from both Spain and Morocco. Despite this, Kissinger, knowing that Morocco and Mauritania were planning to partition the country between themselves, lied to Gerald Ford by telling him that the International Court of Justice ruled in favor of Morocco in regards to the Saharan conflict. Months later, in an event known as the Green March, Morocco invaded and occupied the Western Sahara. This resulted in the conflict which killed up to 21,000 people as the Sawari people tried to fight for the national independence. To this day, the conflict is unresolved, with the Western Sahara receiving limited recognition and Morocco still occupying the country. Besides his actions in Indochina, Kissinger's policy towards Latin America is probably considered his wickedest deed, and it's not hard to see why. I already talked about this some in my Pinochet's right-wing apologist video, so I'll make this quick. Kissinger oversaw the CIA Track 2, or Project Food Blend policy, to try and destabilize the democratically elected Salvador Allende government by encouraging the Chilean army to overthrow him. During the process, the CIA gave a group of Chilean army officers 50 grand to kidnap Rene Schneider, a constitutionalist who refused to overthrow Allende. In their third attempt at kidnapping Schneider, they ended up killing him. After Pinochet took over, Kissinger and the CIA adamantly supported him and his murderous rampage against the Chilean left. As far as Argentina, after the death of the controversial Argentine dictator Juan Perón, his wife, Isabel, succeeded him as the leader of the country. However, his rule was unstable as she was overthrown by a right-wing military junta. Sound familiar? The result was the Dirty War, a campaign of terror by the army and right-wing death squads against left-wing students, militias, trade unionists, writers, journalists, and others. Up to 30,000 people were forcibly disappeared in the carnage. And guess who fervently supported all of it? That's right, our old buddy Hank Kissinger. Specifically, he gave his infamous green light order for the Argentine army to start massacring dissidents, and told them to make sure it was all done quickly before they received large amounts of international outcry or US sanctions. He also attempted to thwart the Carter administration's attempt to halt the mass killings of the Argentine dictatorships, according to declassified documents released in 2016. In 1974, after a coup in Portugal removed the far-right Estado Novo government from power, the future of Portuguese Timor, half of an island on the South Pacific, was unclear. To the west, it bordered Indonesia, which wished to invade the island in order to incorporate it into their sphere of influence. Both Ford and Kissinger supported an Indonesian invasion of East Timor and met the Indonesian president, Suharto, a day before the invasion actually took place to give him the green light for the assault. 
In addition, the United States continued to sell weapons to Indonesia even during their occupation and invasion of East Timor. And what Indonesia did with those weapons was commit a genocide as comprehensive as Pol Pot's in Cambodia, where a fourth of the Timorese population was slaughtered. As the Timorese people experienced systemic torture, forced starvation, and sexual slavery at the hands of Indonesian soldiers. Only in 1991, after peaceful protesters were shot dead in the Santa Cruz Cemetery of Dili, the nation's capital, did much of the West reverse their course on this issue and begin supporting Timorese independence, which the nation finally won in 2002. After the partition of India in 1947, the subcontinent was split into two states, India and Pakistan. While most people probably know this, what's less known today is that Pakistan itself was divided between the western half of the country we know today and the east, which is modern-day Bangladesh. Pakistan, upon its founding, was an ethnically diverse nation, and to try and keep stability, the government tried its hardest to assimilate all these people into one national identity. This led to trouble in many areas of the country, such as Balochistan, and most importantly, Bangladesh, where the attempted cultural crackdown by the West Pakistanis on Bengali culture had the opposite effect as intended, particularly in regards to their language. Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, declared Urdu the national language, which saw a huge backlash from the Bengali-speaking population. And after one of the most devastating actual disasters in recorded history hit Bangladesh in the form of the 1970 Bahola cyclone, the flames were lit for independence. Pakistan responded to this by sicking its army and a series of Islamic militia groups onto the Bengali people. Anywhere from 300,000 to 3 million people were killed. Genocidal rape was not only practiced, but encouraged by the Pakistani army. Up to 30 million people out of 70 million were displaced. By all intents and purposes, it was the worst crime against humanity the Indian subcontinent had ever seen. And guess who supported all of it? Yup, Henry Kissinger. As all of this was going on, Kissinger adamantly supported Pakistani strongman Yaha Khan, refusing to condemn the atrocities committed by Pakistan or cut aid, at a time when political figures like Ted Kennedy were advocating for doing such. Not only that, but he actively mocked those who bled for the dying Bengalis. In fact, when Archer K. Blood, a consul general in East Pakistan, urged Kissinger to stop arming the West Pakistanis, Kissinger not only ignored him, but proceeded to fire him. Side note, he also called Indra Gandhi, the India Prime Minister whose invasion ended the genocidal rampage taking place, a bitch and a witch. So, what could possibly be worse than all of that? Well, how about let's first look at some stuff that wasn't. In 1975, when Cuba conducted an incursion in Tangola to fight against right-wing guerrillas in the South African army, Kissinger suggested airstrikes against the island nation, as well as deploying marine battalions to Guantanamo Bay. This never actually happened, but if it had, it almost certainly would have started the Third World War. As well, in the 1970s, Kissinger discussed the possibility of overthrowing the social democratic government of Chancellor Willy Brandt in West Germany with disgruntled ex-Nazis. I talk about it more, except it's not even close to the worst collaboration the West had with ex-Nazis. And now we're here. What's the worst thing Kissinger ever did? Say it with me now. You knew it was coming. Kissinger's involvement with Cambodia is probably his most infamous crime, but even though it's the thing that people associate with him most, I don't think the bombing of Cambodia gets quite enough attention for the sheer, unflinching destruction and misery Kissinger brought on that small Southeast Asian nation. But first, as always, some context. After the 1954 Geneva Agreement, Cambodia was decided to be a neutral nation in the Cold War, led by the monarch under King Sinahuk. The country was extremely corrupt, but stable compared to its neighbors, the Republic of Vietnam and the Kingdom of Laos. However, in 1969, the small country became an interest to the United States in South Vietnam because of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a logistical network designed to ship armament from North Vietnam to supply Viet Cong rebels in the South through the two neutral nations of Laos and Cambodia. The Nixon administration wanted to cut off this trail, forcing North Vietnam to the negotiation table, so they decided to drop bombs on Cambodia. Lots and lots of bombs on Cambodia. 2.7 million tons to be exact. And these bombs killed, give or take, 100,000 Cambodian civilians. This will be bad enough on its own, but trust me, it gets worse. The king of Cambodia had not approved of these bombing measures, and as a result was removed by a far-right military junta led by Lan Nol. The king fled and encouraged the Cambodian people to support the Khmer Rouge against the new Khmer Republican government. Given the fact that the king was viewed as an almost godlike figure by the Cambodian people, this endorsement turned them against the new Khmer Republic extremely quickly. That that's right, not only was this bombing campaign massively destructive, but it was also incredibly ineffective. For further proof of this, in 1970, the Khmer Rouge was only able to amass an army of 4,000 men. By 1972, as the bombs rained down on Cambodia, they were able to amass an army of 70,000. In the end, the destruction the U.S. brought on Cambodia was practically manna from heaven for the Khmer Rouge, who took advantage of the suffering of the Cambodian people to seize state power, which they eventually did in 1975. After they seized power, the Khmer Rouge launched a genocide that killed one Cambodian and four, including political dissidents and ethnic minority groups. 
This was only ended when the Cambodians, after several failed incursions into the country, were invaded by Vietnam, and a puppet government was set up in its place. The result was a 10-year-long war resulting from the occupation, in which countless Cambodians and Vietnamese needlessly perished in the fighting, and in which the United States tacitly supported the Khmer Rouge insurgents. And guess who oversaw all of it? Guess who approved every single one of the 3,875 bombing runs in that country? Guess who played a crucial role in keeping the bombing of Cambodia, and the bombing of Laos for that matter, secretive from Congress and the American public? No knowing they wouldn't support this brazen attack on a neutral nation. And guess who was willing to immediately turn around and support the very same people who was supposedly fighting against the moment it was convenient for him? That's right, Mr. Henry Alfred Kissinger himself. In a way, Henry Kissinger is not just responsible for the bombings that took place under his administration, but for the deaths caused by Pol Pot's genocide and the Cambodian-Vietnamese war that took place afterwards. And while Kissinger was responsible for many, many, many crimes and atrocities, I don't think any of them were quite as severe as what he did to that small Southeast Asian country on the Gulf of Thailand. To put it simply, Henry Kissinger was a monster, and he, leaves, and he leaves behind one of the worst legacies of any public office holding Americans to my memory. The fact that this man is still held in such high regard by so many members of our intelligentsia and our society in general is genuinely repulsive, and I hope this video has served to further inform the general public of who this man really is and the atrocities he's responsible for. I'm Man the Wall, and I'll see you next time.